My name is Karina Morocco with EBD Group, and we are here at Biotech Showcase 2020 in San Francisco. Today I'm joined by Lawrence Lamb. He is the Executive Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer at Incisys. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, so could you start off by telling us a little bit more about your company? Incisys was formed on a cold winter day in New York, uh, one of the first, the first time in 100 years the subway had been uh, shut down. I was in New York uh, on business and William Ho, who currently at that point in time ran a fund called Ada Point Capital, uh, had been to the ASH meeting uh, before, uh, a few months before, and had heard about, uh, they talked about different types of endotherapies therapies than CAR T cells. One of my colleagues who spoke with him at the ASH meeting called him and told him that I was in town and that I was marooned at the Waldorf Astoria. It's not a bad place to be marooned at. And he walked up from his office at uh, 28th and Madison to uh, come down and uh, have lunch and we talked about gamma delta T cells and uh, alternative types of immunotherapy uh, for about three hours and at that point uh, we decided that uh, to move forward with uh, at least scale up and uh, validation of a clinical uh, a clinical ready uh, procedure and then uh, ultimately once that was completed and we had uh, finished our uh, INDs. I wound up leaving my position as professor of medicine uh, at uh, UAB and joining the company uh, just about a year ago, January 1st, uh, 2019. Great story. Um, so can you tell me more about the observations that led to your immunotherapy program? Yeah, I had the uh, I had the high privilege of doing a postdoc with Adrian G, who was formerly the uh, director of the immunotherapy program at Baxter Laboratories uh, before he went back into academics. And this was in 1991. I was his postdoc uh, at the University of South Carolina. And during that time, I had a project to watch immune reconstitution from bone marrow transplant patients who had received alpha-beta T-cell depleted grafts. Uh, and we noticed during that time that uh, several patients were developing very high numbers of gamma-delta T-cells. Not all of them, about a fourth of them. Uh, and that these patients were living longer and uh, their disease was not relapsing. Uh, where at that point in time, transplant was very edgy uh, and patients were very sick when they came to transplant and their survival rate was 20 to 30 percent, where we were up around uh, 90. Uh, and we did a lot of biology uh, to show that the uh, gamma delta T cells were donor derived did they kill the patient's leukemia, patient's leukemia cell lines, that sort of thing. And we did a six an, or a nine year look back to see if that effect was still, still durable. And uh, it was with 71% surviving eight years out and 22% um, and, uh, uh, that didn't develop the finding uh, still surviving. Now, Ken, uh, I wanted to put in just a little, uh, a little comment about that because uh, this was a sort of emotion fueled as well. I remember, uh, there was a time uh, in the uh, mid-90s when we were taking care of about uh, unusually six uh, adolescent girls that were on the bone marrow transplant unit at the same time. Uh, and they got to be good friends with each other and uh, did things together and by December uh, all of them were dead but two. And uh, this kind of hit me during Christmas about that time that uh, that uh, Number one, that I was pretty bummed out about it, but number two, that uh, both the girls that were alive were girls that had increased gamma delta T cells. And I said, we need to do something about this. You know, and sort of formed the basis of the next 25 years of my career. Yeah, it seems like a very inspirational yep. story. So could you expand a little bit more about gamma delta T cells and how they differ from other T cells and NK cells? Gamma delta T cells are a, um, and they are linked between what we call the adaptive immune system, which are classical T cells that express CD4, CD8, uh, recognized peptides, that sort of thing, and the innate immune system, which are first responders. Uh, gamma delta T cells uh, can kill several different ways uh, through the T cell receptor, through a molecule called NKG2D. They can recognize antibody-coated cells in a, with a phenomenon we call antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, and uh, they can also present antigen that uh, can enhance and in, increase an immune response by drawing antigen-recognizing uh, 
alpha beta T cells into the response as well. Uh, I like to use a military analogy. They're kind of like what we call an A1, AC-130 gunship that has guns and on every side of the uh, side of the plane. You can't uh, you can't shoot at it from anywhere. And uh, it seems and gamma delta T cells are much like that. They kill like NK cells uh, primarily through uh, perforin granzyme and recognition of NKG2D. But they don't have a lot of the inhibitory receptors that NKG2D uh, th that NK cells do. And uh, they don't, um, uh, they're, in, they're MHC independent. So regardless of the uh, MHC status, the gamma delta T cells can recognize the malignant cell and kill it. And so I see that one of your main platforms is something called drug-resistant immunotherapy. Can you expand a little bit more about that? Yes, we, f we uh, showed back in the uh, early uh, 2010s that um, we could increase the receptors that gamma delta sees on cancer by giving chemotherapy. But it was only for a sh very short time that the receptors can upregulate by about 600% uh, during the time that therapeutic levels of chemotherapy are on board. Once they fall off, the DNA damage caused by the uh, chemotherapy starts to repair it starts to be repaired in the cell and these receptors, their stress receptors, start to go back down again. It's like the cell goes, all right, I'm done with that. But you can't give chemotherapy and cell therapy together at that point because the chemotherapy also kills your responders, kills your gamma delta T cells, your alpha beta T cells, your NK cells, like everything that responds. So even though you've got this tremendous setting for an immune response, you haven't got the soldiers there that can come in and deal with it. So what drug-resistant immunotherapy is in the first iteration that we're working with is we put a, a gene in the cell that is the same gene that makes a brain tumor naturally resistant to this is a uh, principal form of uh, chemotherapy, temozolomide. So the gamma delta T cell remains fully functional at therapeutic and super therapeutic levels of chemotherapy so that you can actually treat the patient while they're getting chemotherapy and while these receptors are upregulated. So what we've found in our animal models is we can go from uh, just a small increase in medium survival to animals that are in which tumor is totally re eradicated and uh, live uh, disease-free until we decide to go in and have a look at the, at, at the brain or the tissue that we're, uh, that we're treating. So drug-resistant immunotherapy means that the immunotherapy, the immunotherapeutic cell has been modified to be resistant to the chemotherapy. Yeah, and so on top of that, could you summarize some of the current clinical trials? Yes, we have two clinical trials getting started. The, fir the first drug-resistant immunotherapy trial is in glioblastoma. Uh, it will uh, begin to accrue patients in the next two to three weeks. Uh, we have all of our approvals, and this will be done at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, with Dr. Burt Neighbors as PI. Uh, Burt has done a number of uh, clinical trials. He uh, has the... Uh, Neuro-Oncology Clinical Trials Consortium uh, along with two others and is a great place to do this work. The second trial is very different. It's not, it's not drug-resistant immunotherapy. It's replacing uh, the, immune the lapse in immune reconstitution that occurs during allogeneic bone marrow transplant. Uh, haplo in haploidentical allogeneic bone marrow transplant for leukemia and lymphoma, the uh, immune system is ablated and then three days later, and four days later, the patient's given an additional dose of chemotherapy specially designed to kill cells that might start graft versus host disease, or, you know, the incoming immune system recognizing the host as foreign. Uh, this puts a patient in uh, a profound state of immune deficiency for an extended amount of time, and the patient can relapse their cancer uh, during that time. As a matter of fact, the relapse rate is around 50%. We are looking at gamma delta T cells to bridge that gap. Uh, we manufacture gamma delta T cells from the donor and we deliver them to the recipient uh, within about 14 days after the, chemo the chemotherapy is over and we uh, continue to support that patient uh, with, uh, with uh, guarding their immune system until it recovers to the point where this is, the relapse is hopefully no longer an issue. Yeah, and so could you tell us some of your goals for NCSIS over the year? 
plans for the year? Well, certainly get the clinical trial started. This has been something we've been working on for a long time and it's great to see it coming out. We just, uh, we need a final contract signed, which will probably happen this week or next, and then we'll be off and running at both institutions. Of course, uh, we are raising a Series B funding. We have a lot of very interesting combinations with drug-resistant immunotherapy in the pipeline. We'd like to move those into uh, at least FDA pre-IND meetings and on into phase one clinical trials. Uh, and um, we would like to, to build the personnel in the company. Right now we've got eight people that are doing all this work. Remarkable that we've been able to do this with just eight people, but I think that uh, we could do a lot more with more folks. So we plan to build out the company, uh, uh, book our Series B, and on to further indications and uh, phase two uh, trials of uh, different combinations. Great, well thank you so much for talking to us today and best of luck with your company. Thank you, that was fun.